Now that we have spent some time practicing using the visual principles and understanding these building blocks of design, we're going to add another layer. And how do we use those concepts that we've worked on so far to express more complex ideas and emotions? So as you work to begin on part two of this assignment, you will need to express emotions and abstract ideas through simple shapes. This can be difficult at first, but integral to the work of a graphic designer. This is very similar to part one in terms of the rules and the criteria of what you'll be doing. You will get to choose what shape category you want to work in, but you will still need to hit those same constraints and express these more complex emotions by layering together the concepts and visual principles we learned in part one. So approach these abstract ideas by thinking about the principles and the connotations they have. For example, we know that an asymmetrical layout is more dynamic and active in its use of space. Asymmetry will be more valuable to convey chaos, where symmetry will be more effective to communicate order. In addition to this, there's some other concepts that we want to consider here. These aren't necessarily visual principles that we learned in part one. These are more overarching concepts about design and communication visually that can help you not only in this assignment, but in all of the work that you do as a graphic designer. The first is the idea of proportion. Proportion is the relationship of two or more elements in a design and how they compare with one another. Proportion is said to be harmonious when a correct or desirable relationship exists between the elements with respect to size, color, quantity, degree, or setting. Good proportion adds harmony, symmetry, or balance among the parts of design. So this is really ensuring that there's good balance in your piece, maybe considering also the overall unity of what you're going after. And this can be different depending on what kind of communication you want to create in the emotions that you're trying to express. But one way to think about them is a little bit like coffee. When we look at coffee drinks, particularly that are made with espresso, there's different proportions that happen that create different kinds of drinks. And what's interesting to think about with this is, you know, you may or may not be a coffee drinker, but really part of it is that you'll notice that there's strong proportions that are being used. None of these drinks are really that similar in the amount of hot water, steamed milk, foam, or espresso. They're pretty distinct and different, and that creates different drinks that have a drastically different taste. So I think that's important when you think about proportion is sometimes you want something to be more dominant and other things to be maybe a little bit more in the background or a little bit smaller. So really allowing the piece to have contrast and scale, which we're showing here, can really help create good proportion. This can also happen with white space too. How much of the frame are you going to fill and what does that mean? If you're creating something that's maybe more calm, maybe a little bit more serene, maybe by not filling the entire frame, that square composition that you have, maybe that's a better way to express that. I think oftentimes white space plays a huge role in proportion, and it's not only about how large or how dominant the elements that you're creating are, but also how much of the space or the format that we have do they take up. Another thing to think about is contrast. Contrast is the juxtaposition of opposing elements, so opposite colors on the color wheel, you know, value in terms of light and dark, or potentially even direction of horizontal versus vertical. Contrast allows us to emphasize or highlight key elements in your design. Contrast of color, shape, size, space, scale creates visual attraction. Different shapes can be used to provide contrast in a composition. Similar shapes may not be as visually appealing. So it's similar to proportion. These things work in conjunction with each other. Having strong contrast is what makes those coffee drinks that we looked at drastically different, right? If two of them were very similar in their proportion and didn't have a strong amount of contrast between the ingredients, they wouldn't be as interesting or unique. And in design, oftentimes we like contrast. It creates interest and it can really help us push ideas and make them more clear. So here's one example of contrast. This is a, a zine called Gratuitous Type. It's by Alana Schlenker. And it's all about large type. A lot of this is really about really large type, which she refers to as gratuitous type. But I love the cover of this one issue of the zine because you have this strong contrast between this large A and then this smaller type that lays on top of it. And I think that contrast is what makes this cover interesting. There's also a choice though to have low contrast in the background between the light pink color and the white, which allows the A to not completely take over. So there is some control of the hierarchy here that makes it successful, but they're still able to achieve that high amount of contrast and scale, which is really what is making this cover interesting. Here's another example of contrast. This is on an app. This was by Wedge Studio. It's their Wino website. 
And what's interesting about this one is a couple things. One, we have really high contrast of color, which obviously we're not dealing with on this particular assignment, but it is something to understand for future assignments that having strong contrast in color can be really valuable. It can be really useful. Here we have a limited palette with just really black, white, and orange. And you can see how that orange really pops and really becomes a dominant visual element of this design. But there's also a high contrast in the typefaces that are selected. We have this kind of handmade typeface on the left that looks like handwriting. We have this very formal serif at the top. And then we have this sans serif that's being used as well. So there's a nice amount of contrast in the kinds of typefaces that are being used. And that really also helps this design be successful. And in general, what you'll learn as you work with typography and take our typography courses is that in general, a large amount of contrast in the typefaces that you choose is also very valuable. Another thing to think about is systems thinking. Designers who use systems thinking look at a problem as a part of an entire system of connected concerns. So this is something that's a little bit complex but could potentially apply to your design. Although you're only designing these single compositions for each emotion that you are communicating, sometimes you can create systems thinking within that piece. Sometimes there's almost a little bit of a narrative storytelling that we tell with the shapes within that square. But more importantly, this applies to larger projects where designs are carried out across multiple substrates or packages. Here's a good example. This is from Firebrand. They're a studio in LA that's run by Shessa Garbutt. And this is her Sip and Sonder coffee. And what's really interesting about this, if you can imagine, is they probably create quite a few different kinds of coffee. Here's three of them. So Shessa has really worked on creating a system. We have a bag with a logo at the top in the middle. They're always the same color. We have this rectangular label where there's some kind of an interesting photo collage on the left that's also a square. And then we have some typography on the right. This is systems thinking, right? She's built a label system that will allow all of these labels to be created very quickly, but again, also help the viewer understand not only what coffee are they looking at, but also to know that these are all from the same brand of coffee and that there's a relationship between them. There's another example from Marcos Key. This is the Dadu Children's Museum, which is in Qatar. You can see the logo on the right, that Dadu that's in those red shapes. So that's actually their logo. But what's really interesting is this is a brand that has a lot of systems thinking in terms of how the logo applies and how it's used throughout the piece. So here's a little animation where you can see how that logo can twist and kind of turn and combine together to create all of these shapes they use for all different kinds of things. If we go back to the slide before, you'll notice that even they use these shapes for the actual frames of the photos. So those photo frames and those shapes that are holding typography are all built out of the logo. So this is another example of systems thinking where the designer has actually thought about this logo and how it can be used and reused and kind of molded together to create this really unique brand experience. Gestalt theory is a really important concept in design and it can be a little bit complex. There's a lot of facets to Gestalt theory and it's sometimes considered a distinct principle of design like the other ones we learned in part one. But Gestalt in general is the concept that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Gestalt is a concept from psychology where theorists note the propensity of humans to conceptually group things together to make a meaningful whole. So this is really about our brains and how they work and how they perceive visuals. And understanding this can really help you create strong, compelling designs. So let's look at some of these concepts. So one of them is the idea of closure, which we're seeing on the left in that G. It's basically the concept that our brains are going to connect the parts of the G together so we read that as a G. We're not reading that as three distinct shapes. Our brains can understand that that is broken and that they are meant to go together and it's actually a capital G. Then we have the concept of common fate. And that's really the idea that Things that happen the same way we assume are going to continue to happen that way. So this E, it's getting outlined and they're slowly receding into the background, so moving up and to the right. So our brains assume that that is going to continue to do that. We assume that those E's are continuing to recede in the background in the same way because there's no reason for us to assume that they are not going to continue to do that. Then we have the concept of continuation. This is really an interesting idea. It's just the idea that that line is actually cutting through that S, right? It's a little similar to closure. 
but not exactly the same. Instead of perceiving that as three separate pieces of that line, we assume that that line is one solid piece that is weaving through that S. So that's a really important concept. These are all concepts that are used pretty often with logo design in particular, but that doesn't mean it's the only place that it's used. But again, this continuation is the idea that this thing is going to continue, that it doesn't break, that it's not three separate things, it's actually one thing, and we're just perceiving that it's weaving in and out of that S. Then we have the concept of similarity. Similarity is the idea that our brains connect things that look similar visually. So it's pretty simple, right? These two T's are rendered in the same way. They both have this cut through the middle of them. So we're assuming that for some reason those are related. This is a really handy tool that we use in design because sometimes we want to show people how information is related to each other. That can be through infographics or even in page layout where we want someone to understand that different parts on the page are a part of the same story. So by treating them similarly, you send a visual signal to the viewer that those are related and they go together. Then we have figure ground, which we've talked about a little bit already, positive negative space. That's where we use the positive and negative space to create more meaning. So here we have the A, where the actual parts of the A have been pulled out and we've changed that center portion into a rocket. Then we have proximity. Proximity is the idea that things that are close together and relate to each other, our brains are gonna connect together. So here this concept is actually also using similarity to an extent, right? Because the light blue Squares are all being treated the same, so they're similar, so our brains are reading those together, and that's making us see that L. We're not seeing a rectangle and then kind of a line that bends, right? We're actually seeing that L, but part of that is also the proximity. If these squares were spread further apart, we actually wouldn't be able to read that L, right? We would start reading things as separate shapes, which would become difficult. So it's not only the similarity of the color that they're using here, but it's also the proximity of those squares that helps us connect those things together and to see that letter L. And then also symmetry. Symmetry is just another thing that's very useful. It gives a harmonious feeling like we talked about. It has order and organization. And so our brains tend to prefer that, although we've already talked about that sometimes that's not the goal and that's not the best way to communicate an idea. But it is a pleasing element psychologically to our brain. So it's always something we like to consider. When viewing design, humans apply this principle unconsciously by seeing connections among and between the elements in the design. The overall perception of gestalt in a design is created through harmony, unity, balance, proportion, proximity, and other visual cues. Designers can use this principle to create visual connections and relationships that clarify and strengthen the overall feel and meaning of the design. So gestalt theory runs through almost everything we do because it's just an inherent aspect in the way our brains work and perceive our visual world. So understanding that perception, understanding these concepts can really help us create stronger designs and they might even help you as you work on articulating visually these complex emotions using the visual principles from part one. Well, let's look at some logos. Here's some very famous logos that all use strong gestalt concept. So on the left, you have Unilever. This is by Wolf Olins, which is a studio out in the UK. And here we're really working with proximity because of the way that all of these little elements come together that represent the different businesses of Unilever come together and create this U. We're also relying on closure a little bit as well, right? The U is actually being created, one, through the proximity of these elements together, but also it's allowing our brains to view that as a U rather than those individual shapes. So those two concepts are working in conjunction together here to make this a really successful logo. Then we have the middle logo, which is the World Wildlife Foundation, which is done by Landor, now Landor and Fitch. And we have that panda. This might be a logo that you've seen before. So this is one that really plays with positive negative space. We have the black and white figure ground that are really helping create that panda. We also are relying a little bit again on the idea of closure. So here, although the panda is open and air is coming inside of it, which is actually what makes it a really strong logo, we're able to still connect things together and see the overall shape of the panda. The last one here is the Girl Scouts logo. Unfortunately, this logo is no longer, but this was originally done by Saul Bass. And here we have three faces that are being connected together, and they also are in the shape of a badge. This is another one that has closure happening. There's actually, again, white space or negative space running through the mark, but we actually are able to still see 
those three faces, there's a little bit of closure happening where we're actually visually perceiving this thing as that overall bad shape that connects together, even though there are portions of it that do not connect together. This one also has a really strong figure ground or positive negative space relationship where there's white and green being used that represent different skin tones of these girls. And it's also allowing us to use negative space in an interesting way. So another example of a logo that's really powerful, that really has a lot of meaning, and a lot of that meaning is created through the concepts of gestalt theory. You could also argue that there's a little bit of similarity being used here. The faces are rendered very similarly, which helps us know that they are three faces and they're related to each other, and I think that's another thing that makes this logo strong. If the faces were drastically different, it might not be quite as successful, because it might be difficult for the viewer to actually identify them all as faces, where when they're the same, it helps us really see that there are three distinct faces there, although they're really similar, but there are three different ones that are included. That gets us to the Visual Principles Part 2 assignment. So you're going to work to complete Visual Principles Part 1, and then you're going to move on to Visual Principles Part 2, which is what this lecture was about. Again, you're going to start by sketching possible emotions after reviewing the list, which I'll show in a second. You're going to select three emotions from that list and work to create compositions. You need to upload your thumbnail sketches of the discussion again, and those will ultimately be a part of your finished assignment as well. All of the same rules still apply from part one, so don't forget about those, but you can choose what shapes you want to work with. So you could do one point, one line, one plane if you'd like, but maybe certain shape groups might lend themselves better to ideas that you have. As you're sketching, it would be good to explore all of those different shape groups, but for the final, it's really up to you. You're not required to do all three. Maybe you end up with all three that are point or all three that are line. It's really about what is going to have the strongest and clearest communication for the emotions that you select. In addition to that, we want you to really think about the visual principles from part one. So symmetry, asymmetry, tension, chaos, all of those concepts that were taught we want you to think about how can you leverage those ideas and layer them together to express these emotions. Because that might really help you if you're looking at something like anger. You might want to rely on tension, chaos, potentially asymmetry, right? Those might be concepts that would help you articulate these things. Where, you know, maybe something like despair, maybe that would be more useful if you use symmetry or balance or rhythm in an interesting way. So we really want you to not forget about those concepts from part one. We really want you to think about how you can use those to communicate these terms. And these are the terms that you can choose from and you can choose any three that you like. So again, that first step is about sketching. So you're gonna create these thumbnail sketches of your words and we highly recommend and want you to explore the different shape groups. Again, all the same rules apply from part one. So make sure you pay attention to that. But in the end, as we select the finals, it is not required for you to have one of each shape group. So here's some sketches from a former student. You can see how they're using those terms as well below each one that they're layering together to articulate visually these concepts. So in the upper left, we have panic and it's asymmetry in space. We have number three, rhythm and scale. So those are being layered together to create the meaning of these emotions because that is required for the final. So on your final compositions, which will look like this, you're going to list your emotion, but then you're also going to list the concepts from part one that are being utilized to actually create that emotion visually. And list as many as you can. You know, you should definitely be able to list symmetry or asymmetry. One of those definitely applies, so there's one for sure. But then look at how many other ones you can list and how can you layer these things together to create more meaning. So hopefully that helps you get started on this assignment. Always know that there's an assignment sheet for you and you can always email your instructor if you have questions or concerns or need further help. I hope you really enjoy leveling up and now working with these simple shapes and the concepts from part one to communicate these more complex emotions as this is really vital to everything we do in nonverbal communication for graphic design.